Dr. Jaipal Singh Memorial Oration. I would like to call upon the chairpersons, Dr. Sanda Rao G from Vishagapatnam, Dr. Sunil Kumar from Jamshedpur, Dr. Binde Kumar from Patna, Dr. Durga CK from New Delhi, Dr. Bir Kumar Sharma from Impal. And the topic of the discussion, management of bile duct injuries following cholecystectomy in laparoscopic era. And speaker for the section, Dr. Moirangdam GS from Impal. We welcome all of you. Thank you, thank you. I welcome my co-chairpersons on, on to this meeting. I also welcome the distinguished speaker, Dr. Moirangatham GS from Impal. This is a, a prestigious oration in the name of Dr. Jaipal Singh Memorial Oration. And now I read the citation on Dr. Jaipal Singh. Padmashri Dr. Jaipal Singh, born on 13th May 1930 at Mo Meerat, Uttar Pradesh. He got his MBBS degree from Sarojini Naidu Medical College, Agra, in the year 1952. He received a master's in surgery from Sarojini Naidu Medical College, Agra, in 1955. Dr. Jaipal Singh served for nearly 35 years in Irvin Hospital, Dr. Ram Manohar Lohia Hospital, Safdarjang Hospital, and University College of Medical Sciences in New Delhi. Dr. Jaipal Singh, between 1989 and 92, was the director of Rothak Medical College and Hospital in Haryana. He took he worked, his work on childhood burns, hernia, surgical nutrition, a new operation for a prolapse of the rectum has received wide recognition. Dr. Jaipal Singh trained in pediatric surgery under the Colombo plan in the year 1968 at the hospital for sick children, Great Ormond Street Hospital, London. He had been to United Kingdom and United States of America on WHO fellowship to study the organization of trauma services. Dr. Jaipal Singh had written a thesis on newer etiopathological aspects of urinary calculi and means of preventing their recurrence, which secured him Harivam Ashram Petrit Dr. S. Rangachari Research Endowment Award in the year 1986. Dr. Singh earned recognition for his work in surgery and had the honor of being appointed as honorary surgeon to two presidents of India and was honored by the Padma Shri by the president of India in the year 1991. On 24th September 97, Dr. Jaipal Singh breathed his last. The Association of Surgeons of India started the oration in the name of this great surgeon in the year 99. Now I request my fellow co-chairperson, Dr. Sunil Kumar from Jamshedpur to read citation on the orator, Dr. Moirangatham GS from Imphal. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Sunil Kumar. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Dr. Santara. To introduce Dr. G. S. Moirangatham, who is a MS and FRCS from Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh. He was born on 1st March 1954, is a graduate from Reims Imphal and a postgraduate in surgery from PGI Chandigarh. He was further trained in the UK and was admitted to the fellowship of Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh. Dr. Moriangatham joined the Department of General Surgery at his alma mater, Reims, Imphal, and through 40 years of teaching and operating career, and had occupied various posts in accordance with his seniority and experience, and finally to the chair of professor and then as head of the department. He was instrumental in the starting subspeciality of surgical gastroenterology, hepatopancreatobiliary, and finally minimal access surgery in northeastern part of India. After his retirement from Reims, he continues his operative work at Sija Hospital in Paul and continued to train DNB residents. He had mentored many young surgeons in the region and guided them in the, their professional and academic career. He's a member of ASI, MRC, IAGES, CELC, IHPB, ETC, and had made significant contribution in conferences teaching and training programs. Dr. Moirangatham was the national president of CELSI in 2016. He was the founder secretary of Manipal chapter of ASI and had represented the chapter in the National Executive Committee. Dr. Moirangatham is widely traveled to attend surgical conferences at different parts of the world 
made presentation in a variety of topics with emphasis on hepatopancreatobiliary related areas. He has assisted Medical Council of India and National Board as inspector, examiner, and assessor. It is apt to honor this Duane in the field of surgery from Northeast India for his immense contribution with the prestigious Dr. Jayapal Singh audition for the year 2020 on a topic close to his heart, management of by duct injuries. Back to Dr. G.S. Moirangatham, all yours, sir. We welcome Dr. Moirangatham G.S. to deliver his oration. Please welcome, sir. Okay. okay. <clears throat> Good evening uh, to all my fellow delegates of ASICON 2020. And first, I must thank to uh, that the uh, ASI headquarters for awarding me the Dr. Jaipal Singh prestigious memorial award and my my CR person for kind instruction. Thank you once again. And the topic I'm going to talk today is about the management of bile duct injury following Polish chapter in La Pacific era. Bile duct injury has been defined as either it's a leak, either stricture or ligation, or it has been transected. Unless, treat, unless we treat on time, that will lead to fatal complications. Polycytoctomy with open or laparoscopy, these are the commonest cause for iatronic bile duct injury. Incident, it has been reported in open around 0.1 to 0.2%. And laparoscopic cholecystectomy, the latest one is around 0 0.6 to 0 0.7. In the, in the initial period of starting left surgery, it was as high as 40 percent. It has come down now to 0.6 to 0.7 percent. And majority, of course, uh, not detected during surgery. And uh, there are many contributory factors. Surgeon, as a surgeon, we also contribute to bile duct injury, number one. Say even you know it, it can happen. It can happen uh, irrespective of the surgeon expertise. Even in the best in the hand of the best surgeon, bile duct injury can be there because those expert surgeons sometimes they are overconfident. And then during learning cup of the learning surgeon, and say then we cut the CBD thinking it was cystic duct, and sometimes we injure the unsealed duct while performing a dissection, and then. The, another is failure to convert when the time, when the feed is not appropriate, and we continue to do it. Again, patient's contribution, unclear color strangle, and there's an infection, dense adhesion, anomalous vascular biliary system, and other pathological conditions that we come across, like a Mirage syndrome, gentle cholecystitis, impairment gall weather, Impacted calculus in infundibulum. These are some of the pathological conditions we come across and we are forced to convert it. And there are different types of bile duct injury, the classification that the bismuth to correlate, steward way classification, Stedberg classification, Hanover classification. There are many classifications, but normally Stedberg classification is the most accepted classification. And <clears throat> And these are, uh, you know, Stedberg, we go by A, B, C, D, uh, D, E, E, then E, e, e correspond with the bismuth classification, E1, E2, E3, E4, E5, and E6, and uh, let me come one by one. And management of bile duct injury, it depends on the time and the type of injury. Say, number one, when we detect, when we detect intraoperatively, that was the time. Another, when we detect the injury, in the first week of surgery, and another is when reported with structure formation without control fistula at a later stage. So there are three stages of that when we come encounter, when we encounter bile duct injury. So now, when detected intraoperatively, see, whenever in the intake ball weather, when the intake ball weather, if we see bile in Morrison pulse or in the subhepatic space, if the gold is intact, we, if we see a bile that we must suspect that that's a bile that is injured. So a step back A, step back A is just a bile leak from the shitty custom. When there was some time when we clip, we clip that clip slip off. Or sometimes some minor uh, biliary reticle in gold weather fossa, step back A. 
and the stage work B is so this posterior septorial, right posterior septorial duct. Sometimes we occlude it, and it is not a problem. It's not a major problem. Sometimes uh, stage work C is bilateral from divided right posterior septorial duct, and stage work management stage work A, B, and C. It's very simple. It is if we are if we are sure intraoperatively, it is stage work A, B, C. We need not be worried about. Then we can just re-clip the cystic duct and we can just clip the divided right posterior sectorial duct. Even if we clip that portion, nothing to worry about because right posterior sectorial duct, then only a small segment of the liver. Then whenever there's a facility there, intraoperative cholangiography, whenever required, we have to do, we must do it. And we can continue completion the prospect cholecystectomy but one, one must be very sure that then is mandatory. Then stand back D and E. Right from D and E, then we have to put ego behind. We must convert to open surgery. In the D, D is a lateral injury. D is just a lateral injury. Suppose here, of course, uh, it is on the, on the wall, or it should be on the other side, I mean, wall weather side. Support injury without major tissue lost. It is just a lateral injury without major tissue lost. Then, then in that case, we have to open from stable D to E, we must open it. It should not be attempted further by the laparoscopy. We have to open it. This, this I want to give an emphasis on that. And then, then D, there is a bilead from a lateral injury without major tissue loss. In that case, we can repair primarily with four, four on and abdominal suture. If there is, you can put a stain there and tube drain is a must, is a mandatory and it will be settled down. Then stand back E1 and E2. E1 means, E1 means when the injury is about beyond two centimeter from the confluence and E2 is when it is less than two centimeter of distance from the confluence and if Injury is not caused by the electric artery, and if it's less than 50% of the circumference, then we can do primary repair with the T2 drain to a different site of cholidocotomy, not at the same site, because it leads to stricture. So it may require stenting, and tip, tip, tube drain again is a mandatory. And then if the injury is caused by energy source, and it's more than 50% of the circumference, then in that case, you, you cannot do primary repair. We have to reset that segment of that, you know, already damaged by the energy source. And we have to do bilirrhoenteric anastomosis, preferably hepatocosisonostomy, rarely cholecystodonostomy when the injury is just above D1. Then we can do cholecystodonostomy. And intraperitoneal drill, either single or multiple, again mandatory. And straight back. E and five, E and five, you know, you can see E, 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 E three, E, E five. Uh, just, you know, when the injury just at the level of confluence, you can see the photograph, you can appreciate by yourself. And we, in that case, we have to create a pota plane. When we push the liver upward, then we will be able to find a pota plane. In that case, we have to do hepatogosisonostomy if, it is, if we, you are, we are unable to do hepatogenostomy, then we have to do segment three. Segment three means left hepatic duct. Left hepatic duct is easier to find because it is, it is placed more superficial and atrocious, and you can easily find left hepatic duct, then you can do left segment three hepatogenostomy. And intraperitoneal drain, either single or multiple mandatory again. And just uh, this is a uh, just photograph that uh, before doing hepatocystotomy, I have just shown you. And again, standard E6, it is not described in the original classification. It is a very dangerous injury. Both the lab and the lab have been, uh, completely cut. Confluence has been completely cut. And so it's a difficult and complex surgery. And uh, the attempt, we can attempt to join both right and the left hepatic duct side to side then followed by hepatocystinostomy, and it uh, definitely carry a morbidity and high morbidity and mortality. And uh, if, if at all not possible to join both right and left, 
we can do segment three hepatologist nostromy that on the left 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 that can be anastomosed that, uh, by in the form of hepatologist nostromy the principle of biliary enteric anastomosis we we must keep in mind certain principle that it must be tension free and as far as possible stroma should be white and it has to be mucosa to mucosa if we miss the mucosa almost invariably it will lead to stricture and then as far as possible we should not compromise vascular supply because if you do vascular vascular it is compromised it will lead to fibrosis ultimately it may lead to stricture at the later stage and what i want to give emphasis on that should be handled by only those surgeons having, having enough experience in hepatobiliary surgery. If the operating surgeon, that during that period, particular period in particular hospital, if that operating surgeon is not having enough experience in hepatobiliary surgery, he can call for a rescue surgeon if available in the same institution. If no such rescue surgeon is available at that moment, what he is supposed to do, no attempt should be done for bilirro enteric anastomosis. It will worsen. He only will worsen the condition. And at the most, he can do put a drain, multiple drain, or he can insert a drain to the proximate portion of the cut bile duct, and then put a multiple drain, like in subdiaphragmatic, subhepatic, flank, pelvic, interloop, and close the abdomen, then refer the patient to a center where hepatobilis surgeons are available. And other supportive management in addition to surgery, the high dose of good antibiotic, as we all know, the way that is sensitive to hepatobiliary system, like aminococcus, moxiproxacin, meropenem, metronidone, this is what I have been giving. And high dose of injection T is also helpful, and somestatin derivative, and again, it helps in reducing endogenous secretion of the hepatobiliary system, and of course, support the IV fluid. And again, now that was bile duct injury detected during surgery. Now I'm going to talk about bile duct detected post-operatively. Then when we should suspect bile duct is injured, suppose I have done left body about three days back, four days back, I have done surgery. Then when I should suspect that I have injured a bile duct, in that depend on the type of injury again, the immediate post operative period, if there is a fever, if there is a tachycardia, if there is icterus, if patient having nausea, if drain is already there, if the uh, drain is maximum of more than 500 drain, that means we must suspect that we have injured a bile duct. Then we must do immediate ultrasonography of the abdomen and CSECRA and if, uh, MRI, uh, MRCP that we have to do. And if ultrasonography, the whole abdomen reveal localized biliary collection in the subhepatic or subdiaphragmatic, if it's less than 500, if the MRCP reveal that intact main biliary system, see, uh, uh, my, I, let me repeat, if the collection as a whole is less than around 500, if the MRCP reveal that main biliary system is intact, then it is injury likely to be straight back A, B, and C. In that case, it's very simple that in case you put a pictal drainage of the collection under the sound guided, and at the most you can do re reprascope or re-explore re it, or put multiple drain and come out. Then other supportive measure like which I have mentioned, IV fluid, antibiotic supportive measure, normally it settles down. And uh, if ultrasonography, I'm just showing, showing one photograph here, which uh, I, uh, the patient referred to me, reveal massive intra-abdominal collection. There is a loss of tissue edema. There's a loss of tissue, uh, tissue friability there. Then coagulopathy, then infection, adhesion, biliary system, then biliary sepsis. In that case, you have to do laparotomy and thorough peritoneal toileting, put a multiple drain, wherever possible. But no attempt should be made to do any bilero enteric anastomosis. No attempt. Even expert hand, even in the expert hand, no attempt should be done to do bilero enteric anastomosis. 
at, at the most you can do e e ERCP if the facilities are available, stenting of the CBD, if it is not completely cut, at the most that might help. And then what we are, our aim should be, we have to establish a controlled biliary fistula because by putting a multiple drain, try to establish a controlled biliary fistula, then, then you will be able to control infection. Wait and wash for about a four to six weeks, then allow to develop a stricture with proximate dilatation. Then, then the, in that case, one proximate dilatation is dear after four to six weeks time, you'll be able to do bilero enteric anastomosis. But that also has to be done by a surgeon who is trained in the system. Say again, and this is another category that management bilateral injury with established structure. After some time, after four months, after three months, after six months, this type of patient will come. Somebody must have done, or I myself must have done, after six months, after seven months, or after some, uh, this one, some uh, years or like that, patient come again, that stricture without biliary fistula. So there are two types, one is stricture with fistula, another is stricture without fistula. If it's without biliary fistula, then urgent attention is required because if the fistula, that means damage to the liver will be less. But if they are stricture without biliary fistula, urgent attention is required because there, there will be obstructive biliopathy, usually due to accidental cross keeping the main, main bile duct. And as a sequel of bilirubascular injury, sometimes it might lead to ischemic fibrosis, so that, then that you need to stretch at a later stage. Even if, even if we have not cleaved the bile duct, if, if we have injured the vascular supply, then that might lead to ischemic fibrosis. At a later stage, eventually it may develop bile duct structure. So unless we decompress bile duct structure before four to six times, four, four, to, four to six weeks, then it might ultimately lead to secondary biliary cirrhosis and ultimately chronic liver failure. So it is very, you know, we have to be very careful about that one. And uh, then now another another condition is structured with control biliary fistula. Usually it is because of double injury. Number one, we we cross the main bile duct, then there is thermal injury just proximal to that, proximal bile duct. In that case, obstructive bilirubin is unlikely because there is a fistula is there. Hence, no secondary biliary cirrhosis initially. So blood fluid loss will be there, that blood loss will be there. Take a longer time for approximate bile duct at the porta or confluent to get dilated. So in that case, we are unable to do hepatic jesulosomy technically at the early stage because if there is a fistula, a fistula that approximate portion of bile duct will not will will take a longer time to get dilated, uh, undilated undilated uh, proximal bile duct, it will be difficult for us to do hepatocosis in ostomy. So ultimately, anyway, eventually, this type of patient eventually will be requiring bilirubin enteric anastomosis. Then now, now which type of bilirubin enteric now we have to choose? One is hepatocosis in ostomy, another hepatocosis in ostomy. And then hepatocosis in ostomy is a recommended procedure Advantages are more than the disadvantages. Advantages are because usually this is tensile free anastomosis because we have we have to pull up the long uh, and wide loop of the jejunum. Usually it's tensile free and incident of cholangitis is usually less and anastomosis is also usually less and reflux biliary gastritis is also will not be there. Uh, only disadvantage that technically challenging because when Inter-abdominal abdominal condition, there's loss of adhesion following biliary peritonitis. And it is technically sometimes very difficult to pull up the jejunum free from adhesion, to pull up the jejunum, do an assumption the proximal bile duct, technically is very demanding. So again, it is time consuming. And endoscopic sometimes support their structure develop. Endoscopic stenting, not possible where anastomosis narrowing, elastomy narrowing may develop later on. In that case, stenting is not possible. That is only disadvantage. Otherwise, advantages are more than the disadvantage. And hepatic is the preferred recommended procedure 
for bilirubinic anastomosis. And ne next is hepatico or colitoco desnostomy. It is not routinely recommended. Only is it required when the bile is just above D1. When just D1 above, when it's very near to that, then you can just do colitoco desnostomy. When, when hepatic is technically not possible due to dense intra-abdominal adhesion, when it was not possible at all, I have done in one or two patients, of course, they are doing well. And because, because, it, because of loss of adhesion, it was when it was technically difficult to pull up the jejunum, to feed the jejunum. In that case, you can use dodenum to do hepatico dendrostomy or colidoco dendrostomy. So in, but this procedure, advantages are less than that of the disadvantages. Advantages are technically is easy than hepatico dendrostomy. It take a lesser time while doing surgery and post-operative endoscopy stenting possible. Suppose in due course of time, in that hepatodendrostomy sticks are developed, then endo a 10 endoscopies can insert endoscope and put a stain there. That is one advantage of hepatodendrostomy. This advantage is number one, is always under tension if the injury is higher up level and reflux cholangitis almost usually there and the reflux biliary gastritis because that bile, whatever bile it may go it may go down, it may go to the stomach also, leading to biliary gastritis. And when that, when the anastomosis pull up the duodenum, some, that some of the patient may develop gastric outlet obstruction. These are the disadvantages of colidoco dodenostomy. So now prevention is better than cure and everyone. I'm just repeating the same dialogue because number one, I, we must know our own limitation. I must know my own limitation pre-operative proper assessment to predict or this particular patient uh, that uh, is, uh, I'm going to have a very difficult laparoscopic procedure. We have to assess it. Our resident have to assess it. Our patient have to assess it. Then convert whenever required without any hesitation because conversion is not a failure. It is a reflection of sound clinical judgment of the operating surgeon. This point, if we remember, we can prevent bile injury. Then we have to put our ego behind. Whenever there is a problem, or another hand, whenever in trouble, maybe even my, maybe my junior, if uh, one, should not put, one should not put the ego behind, uh, one should not put the ego in front, whenever required, call even your junior, or because he'll be blessed, he'll not be having tension at that time. He'll be in a better position to repair the damage, to re, re to, re, to do the remedial measure of the damage which we have created. Then when we find unclear calories and polyhepatic triangle, dense adhesion, inflammation, bleeding, confusion anatomy, as far as possible, try to open operative calories liberally and hunters first method and subtotal cholesterol family. It's not necessary that we go down right up to uh, bile duct and it is better to keep a, a, even a portion of the wall, whether at the infundibulum, and but take out all the stores, you can suture that uh, whatever portion of the left behind wall, whether, and if necessary, you can do revise the that later stage. But instead of injuring the bile duct, we have to offer subtotal cholecystectomy. And never use, we should never use energy source around the calorie strangle. And we should never do, of course, it is uh, as all teaching, we should never do panic clipping when they profuse bleeding and, and only a place clip on a structure that full are, they are fully mobilized. And this is the physical view of safety and each civil resident and younger children should be able to demonstrate this one. This is critical view of safety, bile duct and, uh, and then uh, cystic, cystic artery and uh, cystic duct. Uh, this view we must be able to achieve it and the critical view is happy and uh, the tip of a closed clip should not contain tissue this you must be able to see the clip tip of the clip from the tissue and if we need for more than eight clips if we need more blood uh, this one then you have to convert it because something has gone wrong and consider, consider any consideration for blood transfusion. 
is having an indication for conversion because normally, routinely, we don't need any blood. If you think, oh, this is the time I must transfuse blood, that means that is the time you must convert. Factor that suggests. Question, doctor, our allotted time is up. Okay, I'm finishing. That's only when the when when the, when that clip is not fully encompassed by a standard normal clip, that you must suspect that bile duct is uh, bile injured. Any duct can be traced without any interruption to course behind the duodenum. Probably it is CBD. Presence of another unexpected ductal structure, a large artery behind the duct, because right hepatic artery then posterior to CBD. If the moment you cut cystic duct, that the stem you must be able to see, if it disappears suddenly, that means you have injured CBD. So this is like, like uh, intraoperative cholangiogram and the proximal that uh, you must be able to see proximal uh, CBD, proximal intrahepatic bile duct you must be able to see. And this is, uh, yeah, 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 when we have, uh, I was president of CLC, Society Endoscopic Level Science of India, and we have published consensus statement for safe cholecystectomy part one, part A and part B. It has been published in the surgery. Resident surgeon can easily avail this particular topic, and they can read and they can they can uh, they can read and they can take care of so that so as not to injure bile duct as far as possible. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your patient hearing. Thank you once again. Thank you, sir.